Okay, let's get started. So I'm going to talk about RCTs and I will keep this quite high level. Um, and I wanted to make it appropriate for um, any member of the HREC committee, whether you've got a clinical background or not. Um, but essentially, um, there will be some take home messages at the end um, about um, RCTs. Um, but just a bit of an outline. Um, just a bit of an outline is what we're going to talk about today. So the first part I'm going to talk about um, RCTs, what they are, where they came from, some ethical considerations, um, and then a bit of a case study, which I won't go through today, but it's something that um, people can have a look at um, going forward. And then the second part, I actually want to touch on um, first in human trials as well, because uh, uh, specifically in Townsville um, and across the state, uh, we are seeing a lot more first in human trials. So I'll go through um, some basics of first in humans trials and then also a case study at the end of that as well, which I won't go into too much detail, but it will give you an idea of what to look out for um, as a HREC. And then we'll bring it all together at the end with a little bit of a summary. And I think I've got about five take home um, notes um, for the audience from this presentation. If you don't want to listen to all of it, you just listen to the last slide. But I always like to figure out before we get started where we actually came from with randomized controlled trials. And the first one um, was in um, 1747. It was scurvy. Um, you know, scurvy was common and deadly among sea um, sailors on, on long voyages. Um, it was characterized by, you know, some of the symptoms you can see on the screen. Um, and then James Lynn came across and he, provo he performed um, the first controlled trial. So he had 12 sailors. They were separated into six pairs and each of them give them a different remedy. Um, and at the end of it, what they actually understood is that, is that the sailors that got oranges and lemons actually showed the most improvement, even though at that time, James Lynn didn't actually know anything about vitamins. Um, but we do know at this day that um, it was the vitamin C um, that was actually impacting on scurvy. If we go down the timeline a little bit further, we've got our first placebo. Um, was introduced in 18, around the 1860s. Um, Adam Flint was the one that used the first placebo and that was for a rheumatism study. Um, and now we see that used quite frequently. And if we move along the timelines a little bit further, our first randomized double blind controlled trial, well, the first one recorded was actually in 1926. Um, and that was by uh, a gentleman called Anderson. And he actually randomized these people by flipping a coin. So if you don't consider that a randomized controlled trial, then the first one is this TB trial where the actual problem in that time was that penicillin was ineffective. And this was a study to measure streptomycin effectiveness against TB. And this was a novel trial because it was actually the first one that would randomly allocate subjects um, instead of sometimes just using a roll of a dice or a flip of a coin. So it is still consider, considered today that the RCT is the gold standard for clinical investigations. Um, and so what is an RCT? Well, there's a plethora of definitions and essentially it is um, a study that randomly assigns participants into two or more groups, and this is to compare treatments. Um, and it's considered that RCTs are essential because they establish a causation and they actually minimize biases. And there's different principles that come into what an RCT is. Um, control groups, there's blinding, which I'm not gonna go into too much detail about single blinding or double blinding. We can all, we all um, can, can know or have a little, little bit of knowledge about what that is and, and why we do that. Um, but I do wanna to touch on randomization just, just briefly now in this example, and I'm gonna talk you through it because I have seen recently in protocols that come to our ethics committee where the randomization hasn't been um, either specific or not, or the reasoning why we ask a lot of questions around randomization isn't, um, isn't receptive quite well by investigators. And, and the method that I am going to highlight here is commuted block. And, and, and the fact that randomization cannot be an alternating sequence, i.e. the first person gets treatment A, the second one gets B, the third one gets A, the fourth one gets B, and it just continues alternating like that, is because in the literature, if you do it that way, it has actually shown that at the end of your trial, the possibility of an imbalance is somewhere up to 5 to 15%, which is huge considering the amount of money spent on trials. So the permuted block um, is, is quite a really simple method that you can just do by hand and pen, but there are computer programs that do it. 
And again, using a trial that's got two treatments, one A and one B, if you want to organise those in blocks of four, you've really only got six ways that you can organise the sequence of those treatments, which I've given on the screen there. So the way that commuter blocks works is that with each of these blocks, you give them a number. So this block, we can give number two. This block, we give it a number four. This one can be number six and so on and so forth. So you do then generate a random number sequence, two, four, six, one, and that's the, that's the block sequence you use and you join it all up together to get your sequence of randomization. So this method has been shown to be um, pretty much high 90% um, output of a balance at the end of your trial and is the most frequently used sequence that I use when I'm designing um, codes for, um, for trials here in, in, in the studies that I'm dealing with as well. So the crux of it is, is what are the ethical considerations of randomised controlled trials? And throughout this presentation, you'll notice that I do link a lot of the references that I say to the national statement, because I like to do that when I'm reviewing um, trials and, and, and giving information around um, what I'm talking about um, ethically. And, and I'm gonna go through a few things here. And, and obviously informed consent is really important for clinical trials, it's chapter 2.2, the balancing the risks um, and benefits is chapter 2.1. And you can read the reasons why under that um, um, as well. Um, equitable pay participant selection is chapter 4.2. Privacy and confidentiality is chapter 3.2. Um, and then independent review and monitoring, chapter five, um, are all really important. But I guess <laughs> the question at the end of the day is, with all of the stuff that goes on with a big RCT phase three, as an ethics committee member, where do I fit into this? What is the main thing that I should be looking at? And the response that I would give on that is, we're protecting humans and research. Um, and that is the main, the main point that I would get across. Um, and notwithstanding, there is a lot of stigma in media around participants in research. But I think as an ethics committee member, in, and you're looking at a randomized controlled trial, you need to think about, okay, what is the benefits of this trial and the outcomes to society and future patients that may have this disease or condition? And what is the, how, how is the protection of the, and the rights of the participants that are actually going through this trial at the moment? And I acknowledge that as a bit of a balancing act, um, but I think that's the, 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 the mindset and the lens that we need to go into when we're reviewing um, particularly RCT trials. Now, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things before I move on to um, some more RCTs. And I think it's really important that, you, that we all have a bit of an understanding about, as an investigator, what we're actually trying to achieve in an RCT. And to give you an idea of that, so when we're conducting a randomized controlled trial and we get an outcome, the outcome is, is usually likely to one of these four things. So the outcome is usually because the treatment actually had a real effect. Um, it could be because there's bias, it could be because there's data error somewhere, or it could be because there, um, it, it's happened because of chance. Um, and if I'm an investigator, I want to highlight that it's happened because of a real treatment effect and, and, and limit and mitigate any bias, any data error and any chance. And to, to provide further explanation around that, if we look at a, the, the study schema on your screen, which is just a very basic RCT st uh, study schema. There are different levels of bias that can be introduced into an RCT that we need to make sure that are minimized for the protection of our participants. So selection, selection bias, for example, um, let, it, 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 is differences in the baseline characteristics. So, so, so for example, if, if only really healthy people chose to take the medicine or the treatment, it might look like it's actually super effective but that was only because the, the participants were already super healthy. Um, so it can be a really sneaky problem. It can make your study results not quite look right because the groups aren't, the groups compared aren't really the same at the start. So I'm a sports person, I'm a mad sports person. So, you know, think about a basketball, uh, think about a basketball game where one team is actually taller than the other team. Um, and that's because the tall people are the only ones who wanted to play on that team. So, there is a selection bias there that the team has an advantage because they're all tall. Um, the next type of um, bias I want to touch on is performance bias. 
And keeping on the on the basketball theme, so performance bias in the study is making is making sure both basketball teams have the same equipment and rules. So any differences in the game outcome are likely due to the player's skill, not because of the setup the setup they had. Um, and that it's about keeping fair um, during the study and to get accurate results. Um, detection bias, we moved down the schema a little bit. Um, it's, it's similar to having a fair basketball game, but using blurry glasses to watch it. You might miss some of the details or make mistakes in judging a player's or a particular player's performance. Um, this happens, detection bias happens when the tools or the methods used to measure the outcome uh, aren't really reliable and it makes it harder to see the true results. Um, and then the last one is attrition bias. So attrition bias is like um, playing a basketball game where some players actually leave before the game ends. Um, and then with them actually leaving, it influences on how the game result, um, what the game result is at the end. So I just want to move also just briefly on the, um, some statistics one-on-one -on -one because you'll quite often get RCTs that present a, a plethora of, of different um, uh, statistics. And I think it's important if you're on an ethics committee that you, you have a, a generalised understanding of what, what these phrases or what these um, statistics mean. Um, power, we all, we've all heard, heard of power. Um, it can be it is used in sample size calculation to determine what the true difference between the groups is. It's usually um, 80 to 90%. Um, significance, some people call it type one error or alpha. So this is the, the, the amount of false positives you're willing to accept. It's also used in a sample um, calculation. Um, the, significant, the significance level can be either one-sided uh, one one or two-sided tails. So you'll see about, you'll hear um, two-tailed test or one-tailed test. So basically what that means, if it's a one-tailed test, the study is only trying to determine if something is either better or if it is worse. Um, if it's a two-tailed, that means that they're studying and they will capture whether that treatment is actually better or worse. Um, so, and, and I'm not gonna go into um, how non-inferiority trials are, are calculated at this point. Relative risk tell us how many times are like, um, is, is uh, how many times more likely the treatment, the event is likely to occur in treatment and control. Um, if it's one, that means they're the same. Um, if it's less than one, um, the treatment reduces the risk. And if it's more than one, um, the treatment will increase the risk. And you'll quite often get presented with graphs like I've got on the screen here. Um, and you can see the overall result um, shows that the treatment is beneficial, but you can see in trial A, the confidence interval, which is the whiskers on that plot, actually pass that centre line, which is the one line. So at some point, you would probably ask the question or you might be a little bit um, curious to know about that trial A and might do a little bit more digging because the relative risk is actually equal um, at some point in that um, study. Now, risk ratio and odds ratio is also um, something that can be quite confused and, and some people think they're quite interchangeable when they're we're actually not. So the general rule is that odds ratios um, are usually used when outcome has already been occur has already occurred. And the risk ratio is used in prospective study where individuals are, are followed over the time. Um, and yet I've got the two equations there um, for you to, to use, but just to highlight how they're different, Consider a dice. So a dice has six, has six numbers on it. If we wanted to know the risk of rolling an even number, that would equal three divided by six, which is 50%. So I have the 50% risk of rolling an, an even number. But what's, what's the odds of rolling an even number on a die? Well, the number with the event is three, but the left, the, 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 um, the, the divisive number is five. So it's three divided by five. So it's actually a 60%. Um, risk uh, odds of rolling an even. So they are different numbers. So you can't calculate them the same. Probability um, is your p-value. Everyone looks for a p-value, but the only thing that the p-value tells you is that that result happened because of chance. That's why you want that p-value to be low um, to negate that um, outcome being provided because of chance. And the confidence interval um, is a range of point estimates. So quite often we ask for the 95% confidence interval. What that basically means is that if I ran the same trial 100 times, I'm confident that in 95 of those trials, I'm going to get 
a point estimate or an outcome number that is within a range, with, within this range. Um, and you want the confidence interval to be quite strict. Um, that way you know that's been a rigorous, rigorous trial. Um, if the confidence interval is very broad, um, you know that there's probably um, some, some digging to do in that trial's results. So the crux of RTTs, what are the challenges and controversies that we see um, in ethics committees? And patient recruitment is always a challenge. Um, and some argue that some of the inclusion criteria we ask for are quite strict and that limits the inclusion of diverse populations. Um, and this relates to the national statement 2.1.5 and 4.1.8. Um, Follow-up um, can be quite challenging. Um, and I always ask the question in, in the studies that I review is of what is the plan for missing data? If you've got missing data, because we know that follow-up can be challenging, what is the plan for your missing data? Um, or your dropouts, have they been, been considered in your sample size calculation? And that relates to national statement 2.2.5 and 4.9. The, the use of placebo um, is an interesting one. It's, it, it is ethically challenging. Um, but the, the, there is debate and you really need to assess the condition of the disease that the trial is trying to treat or, um, or overcome. And for instance, if you're, having a, if you're running a trial that is to reduce pain, you give one population a, a, the, the intervention, which is a reducing pain medicine, and you give the other population no treatment and that, or placebo, sorry, um, then that, that's probably not ethical because they're in pain. Um, Industry-sponsored trials is challenging as well. Um, we always ask to make sure that there is actually um, statements and, and, and agreements in place, and this relates to national statement, um, particularly Chapter 5, um, and reporting and publication. And we always recommend that um, RCTs are registered on an appropriate registration framework, and I've just listed a couple there, the ANZCTR, clinicaltrials.com. Uh, .gov, sorry, and that's relating to Chapter 5 of the National Statement as well. Um, but in essence, you know, there are still, you know, some uh, stigma around RCTs, control groups, placebo groups. And the bottom picture is my favourite about the informed consent process. And, and I guess we've got to be cognizant um, that these, um, these mindsets are still out in the community um, and with the people that are, are, are potentially going to be involved in these trials. So a case study, what I won't go through is the, is the HR, the hormone replacement therapy trial. It was a women's um, health. It was a, it was a large and long-term study launched in the early 1990s um, to, to investigate the effects of HR hormone replacement therapy on, in um, postmenopausal women. Um, and there was a number of issues with this trial. Um, informed consent wasn't there. It wasn't communicated appropriately. Um, there was there was questions around whether the trial should be halted when there was early signs of adverse events um, that were raised quite early, um, and then there was no actual independent review body who could who could actually do any interim analysis um, and make a judgment call on whether the trial could be stopped or continued. And you'll see that I've got the national statement references there for for you as well. Um, the, the 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 data sharing was withheld. Um, by the drug company, um, and therefore it asks questions about transparency. Um, and therefore, the guidelines and medical practice, it was actually believed that it was the researcher's responsibility to make sure that these were um, updated and maintained as well. I guess at the end of it for RCT is this sentence in the Belmont report sums it up quite well, is that, you know, we need to identify the risks and know which one uh, count and there needs to be some sort of independent review, interim analyses, um, and there needs to be criteria for when uh, these risks surface and what actually happens um, to the trial um, when these adverse um, events occur. So I just want to move on to the second part, uh, which is about first first and human trials. Um, and I guess I just want to start off by mentioning that these are for a new investi investigational drug or therapy. Um, and the participants involved in these sort of trials are, are, are different to large scale RCTs. Um, they typically involve a small number of healthy volunteers. However, um, you can get um, FIH trials that involve um, um, volunteers where it may be their last, last ditched effort, whether they've got a terminal disease or palliative, um, it might be their last effort um, of some relief um, with their particular condition. 
The primary goal, and I cannot stress this enough, is safety. It is only about safety in FIH trials. It's the safety and tolerability of the drug, um, adverse monitoring adverse events, potential risk of treatment as well. And I'll go on to a little bit more about um, dosing, but the objective in FIH trial is to find a, an appropriate starting dose. You need to find the appropriate starting dose. That is your primary objective. You have secondary objectives, which is pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So pharmacokinetics is what the drug does to the body when it's taken. So absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. Pharmacodynamics is what the body does to the drug once it's taken. So um, there are some measurements around that as secondary objectives. Um, and then they will creep in some efficacy um, stuff in there as well, but it is not the primary focus. The primary focus um, is safety in FIH trials. So just about dosing, the dosing is a little bit different on, on, on in, FIH, in FIH trials, and it's really important to, to um, get a brief understanding on how we work out the dosing in FIH trials from an ethics point of view. And I'm just going to go through four methods um, on how we do this. The first one is using preclinical data. Um, so this is just data from animal studies, and we use this to extrapolate into a dose um, that is that may be appropriate for humans. Now, just using preclinical data um, is not really enough on its own in my perspective. The most commonly used method is called the NOEL. So this is the no observed adverse event level. Um, and this is using preclinical studies or animal studies and then adding an element of a safety margin. So the rule that I was taught in my studies when I'm looking at animal studies and trying to correlate into human, first and human dosing, is that using the one tenth of a dose that killed 10% of the animal species is an appropriate starting dose for most FIH trials. Um, but in saying that, there are correlation papers out there, depending on the species of, of animal that um, is in preclinical studies, um, you can transfer and translate um, a, a NOEL level depending on the preclinical levels of the rodents or the animals that you're using. They're all available now. Um, there is allometric scaling. So this is basically using body weight and surface area of, of the animal studies to extrapolate that into humans and using metabolic rate as well. Um, and then there's reference to similar compounds. So if I've got a new first in human trial for um, an ACE inhibitor or, or a common drug, if it's got the same chem chemical structure, we could probably um, hypothesize that it's gonna have a similar reaction and the dosing could possibly be similar um, with an added safety margin as well. Designs of first in human trials. So there's a couple of designs. The most common one um, is the single ascending dose. Um, this is where um, participants are given a, a single dose and then they're reviewed. Um, and then another small group is given an escalated dose on top of that they're reviewed. Um, and then the, what we're looking for is adverse events. And then once there is an adverse event in a group, then usually what happens is that another group is given that same dose. If they have that, the advert, that they have the adverse event, then we take a step back and that's the dose that's used in the, um, in the next phase of the trials for that particular treatment. You can also have multiple ascending doses, and this is particularly if, if you want to speed things up and try and get to that level where you're getting adverse events. And I've just got a correlation table here where you can see that's the single acid ascending dose. Group one will get 10 mg in the first week, 20, group two will get 20, and then group three will get 30. Whereas in multiple, your group one will get the multiple over weeks. So it is a bit of a quicker way to get um, to any sort of level where you can move on to progressive studies with that treatment. Um, I'm not going to go into parallel group design or crossover design or comparator as well, um, because the most of the ones that we're seeing um, in our committee are the SADs and MADs, um, and they have been very favourable with, with great outcomes as well. So what are the ethical considerations for FIH trial? And, and I've, again, I've, safety is the top priority with these. So we need to make sure that safety and minimising risks. We need to make sure that the participants have great informed consent and autonomy, um, that the benefits and potential, the, the beneficence and potential benefits are there. Um, and that even though safety is a primary concern, that the therapeutic is actually going to have the benefits to um, the, the wider audience once it progresses through. Um, we're going to make sure these are all similar ethical considerations we look for um, in, in robust studies anyhow. Um, transparency, accountability and oversight. 
Um, and just an example, which I won't go through, was the TGN 1412 trial. Um, so this was a trial um, for an autoimmune disease such as rheumatoid or leukemia. Um, it involved only six participants, but what happened after the injection is that they all, all pretty much all of the participants had um, a developed a, a, syst a systemic inflammatory response to the treatment. They all require, well, most of them required, required ICU treatment um, and was very life-threatening. And what actually we learned from this was the participants weren't um, communicated about these risks appropriately. Um, the safety monitoring during the trial wasn't done appropriately um, and that there was actually no oversight and there was no protocol for if an adverse event happened, what was actually to occur with those participants. Um, and so they were left to their own accord once they entered the trial. Um, from this, um, there was a lot of learnings and we now have the, um, the detection and uh, mitigation of risk um, guidelines in place for first and human trials. Um, and, and of course, we also, we also have a, a better idea on what methodologies of dose selection techniques to use when we're trying to um, select doses for first and human trials. So I guess in summary, um, what do you need to take away from this as an ethics committee for RCTs and first and human trials? And I think we need to be quite flexible in our ethical review. Um, we need to adapt to novel trial designs. It's not a one size fits all. Um, we've got to make sure that we're on top of the emerging issues across the ethical sphere of research as well. Um, we need to make sure that there is safety data and that there's timely responses to safety data. So for F FIH trials, our review period might be brought back to three monthly or four monthly to make sure that we are on top of safety data and that the investigators actually do their due diligence with collecting that data in a timely manner. Protocol amendments as well, we make sure that they are crucial, um, particularly in trials of this caliber, they are quite um, evolving. Um, so keeping on top of amendments is, is very, very important. Transparent and data sharing go without question. And I guess for committee members, just providing education and training about these sorts of trials and what they might see so they have the confidence to, um, to speak up and to have their um, opinions heard. Um, two papers worth reading is the um, Beerman, um, the Beerman's bomb cell. I'll leave them there. Um, but after that, I want to thank you for listening and happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, Kelvin, that's fantastic. Um, I think the, the comments that are coming through is very much an excellent presentation and really your succinctness of the stats was really welcomed. Um, they're also wondering if your slides will be available uh, later. And is that, that's the thing, that's a general question, Gordon and Sarah, will the slides be available or is it just per speaker that um, discloses think, uh, or overall? Certainly... Certainly recordings are available. And of course, if uh, the speakers wish to make slides available, then slides will be available. Um, I think that would be, you know, we want to put this, the uh, prezos up online, but uh, I guess so we can ask the yeah. slides will be available as well. And um, Kelvin, where do you stand on um, uh, the healthy volunteers versus non-healthy volunteers in first in humans? It, 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 good question. And that's a hard one. It really, I think it really, comes down to the disease state or the actual target of the therapeutic that's being tested. Um, I've seen both. Um, I, I think generally we see a lot of it in healthy volunteers more often, um, but I have seen um, some in, you know, definitely late stage cancer therapies, um, you know, motor neuron sort of disease states where you know, it is a large last ditch effort and therefore these participants are offered um, the chance to participate in FIH trials. Um, so it really depends, Gordon, but, you know, generally I think it's more likely you'll see one in, in a healthy population group. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks for that, Calvin. I think just maybe one more question. Uh, before we move on, uh, this is from Jolene. She's just asking regarding, she would like more information regarding compensation uh, processes and procedures for those that do experience significant adverse events, which I think is generally in patient information sheets and regarding related to the sponsor. Yeah, and I think that's that's a, a, a good point. And I think we don't actually spend enough time having a look at compensation and and 
compensation in the in the um, in the event of an adverse event, but also compensation for taking part in such um, RCTs as well. That's quite variable um, because uh, I think um, you know, and we get asked that more often. People are more aware of their rights and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That um, if an adverse event happens, then what are the comp compensation pathways? And, and you're right, Roberta. I think that has to come down and come back to the sponsor and um, and the actual um, trial setup investigation group as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. That's a fantastic presentation, and we'll swiftly.